Africa Business News, proudly sponsored by EY. Africa Business News, the latest on the Ebola crisis, the Africa-US partnership, who's benefiting, and FDI to rise in Kenya over the next five years. Stay tuned. Africa, it is huge, it is diverse, and its business landscape fascinating and dynamic. And that's our business here on your favorite weekly African business stop. We're joined by Boni Tunya in Nairobi and Wale Famurewa in Lagos. My name is Victor Homoeswana, and this is the Africa Business News. Mambo Boni, this must have been the news story of the week in Kenya. President Uhuru Kenyatta appearing before the International Criminal Court, of course not as president then in The Hague. We spoke about it last week, but now he is back. What's the mood like in Kenya today? That's right, Victor. Now thousands of President's uh, supporters lined up in the streets of Nairobi on his return to Kenya now. He's become the first seating leader or head of state, if you like, to appear at the International Criminal Court. President Kenyatta is accused of uh, orchestrating the 2008 post-election violence that left over 1,200 people dead. There's a lot of bullish sentiment, though, about Kenya from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, about Kenya's economy. Tell us about that. Well, Victor, the International Monetary Fund predicts net foreign direct investment, FDIs if you like, to Kenya that will rise steadily in the next five years to hit 167 billion Kenyan shillings annually. Now, Kenya has been a magnet for investment in a wide range of sectors, including financial and manufacturing, with discovery in gas and natural gases further boosting the FDIs. Now, Victor, the IMF was, however, cautious of the security situation that could hamper the inflow that serves as the key support to the local unit. Now, the multilateral lender said that East Africa's biggest economy, that is Kenya, needs to improve the business environment to diversify sources to the, of, of FDI. But on the EU front, the European Union, there could be trouble brewing in Kenya's floricultural, the flower export sector. What is that all about, Bonnie? Victor, Kenya's flower farms on Friday threatened to relocate to neighboring countries uh, after talks between the EU and the East African community uh, collapsed and thus attracting taxes in accessing European markets. Victor, Kenyan flower exporters had started paying taxes on goods entering the EU from October the first day of October, that is, and while they are relieved to the Economic Partnership Agreement, which grant African products tax-free in the European market, this uh, is said to take six months after the ratification. Now, Victor, anxiety and confusion had gripped the over 60 farms operating in the lakeside town of Naivasha, where we have 75% of flowers um, that export to the EU market. But sadly, Boni, yesterday we heard about the passing of the eminent, eminent academic Kenyan academic Ali Mazrui, it must be said. Right, Victor, it came as a big shock. Uh, as you know, Ali Mazrui is a renowned academic, 81 years of academic excellence, teaching across different institutions of the globe. So it was a big, uh, big, sad and a big blow to the Kenyan academia. We saw a lot of um, uh, condolence message coming from the head of state, his deputy. So it is a big blow for Kenya, Victor. Well, we're in Southern Africa now. U.S. Ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency Patrick Gaspar, stirred a lot of debate last week with his comment that South Africa sometimes seems to be 40 years behind the times when it comes to labor relations. I caught up with him soon after that where he gave me more insight. Check this out. Now, just to throw a spanner in the works, people, even during the U.S.-Africa summit, the joke in China was, oh, well, hey, America is waking up to the story that we have known all along. Is this a realization that China might be stealing the march my, on the U.S., my, or my, is it something well, bigger? Well, you know, my, my friend, if that was a realization uh, in China, uh, I'm heartened by the fact that I know that uh, average Africans, particularly average South Africans, have an entirely different uh, perception, and they know uh, that the United States has been a close, engaged partner in development. Yes for decades. Let's, let's look at uh, PEPFAR for an instance. Right now in uh, South Africa, we've managed together to turn around the scourge of HIV and AIDS. That's only because of investment from the United States to the tune of $4.7 billion over the last decade. That 
lowering uh, the, the threshold in HIV and AIDS, creates opportunities for young people, uh, saves uh, communities, and changes the economic environment here. So maybe uh, that was the joke in China. That's certainly not the attitude here in Africa. But now tell me about the new initiatives that the U.S. will be mounting on the African continent. Are they going to be more win-win? Are they going to be more equitable? By that I mean... Is Africa going to benefit as much well, as the United I States? Think, I think that uh, Africa, uh, Africa, I think, has benefited more from the engagement uh, with the U.S. than average uh, Americans have. I'm, su I'm suggesting that the, tr the, the relationship is different now, and it's a relationship of equal partners who are working for improved outcomes on both sides of the Atlantic. So if you look, for instance, at an initiative like Power Africa, where recently President Obama uh, was excited to announce the tripling of our goals in terms of the megawatts that will be produced uh, on the continent, that's going to benefit uh, African uh, small-scale entrepreneurs, large businesses, the public sector, the private sector, uh, and it will give access to opportunity for Africans in rural parts of their countries as well. Tell that's going to be absolutely transformative, Victor. We Tell shouldn't be we shouldn't be cynical about no, these no, things. No, no, no. I'm not being cynical, Ambassador. But I'm I'm asking. I know General Electric is involved big. That's yes. a big multinational. Yes, it is. Those are visible. There's no doubt about American multinationals getting involved. Now, please give me examples of how the smaller players will benefit from this. Obviously, any uh, small business owner needs access to reliable, consistent, predictable sources of uh, energy. Yeah. Yeah, if you uh, go uh, in too many parts of, uh, of, of Africa, yeah. uh, you see uh, entrepreneurs who have to have uh, their own generators f uh, for fear that they're going to lose power from uh, the municipality. That kind of lack of predictability makes it less likely that someone's going to put their own uh, dollar down to start to start an enterprise. So I actually think that smaller uh, enterprises will benefit much more uh, from initiatives like Power Africa than larger uh, institutions will. You might have heard of him, Ashish Takar. They don't come bigger than that on the continent. In the last few years, a 33-year-old is the founder and CEO of the Mara Group, a pan-African multi-sector business conglomerate with operations in over 19 African countries and 21 countries worldwide. His journey began when he started his first business at only 15 years of age. Last week I met with him in Johannesburg. Listen to this. Talk to me about regional integration. You are running a business in 22 African countries. That must be tough considering that integration hasn't happened on the scale that it should. And what do you think is holding it back? It's a good question, Victor. And I think, you know, on a practical note, we have the policies and frameworks for regional integration. Being a continent in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly of 46 different countries, it's not easy to just make it happen. <laughs> if you look at East Africa, the East African community has been a brilliant example um, and they've moved the quickest, but because there are only five of them. All right? So I think it's, it's important to note when it's smaller and leaner, and even in the East African community, uh, Uganda, Kenya and Rwanda got together and did it even quicker. Um, so it just shows you, you know, when, it, when you have aligned leaders and you have a smaller bunch to work with, it's quicker. That's not an excuse um, for regional integration programs to not happen. But I think we need to move away from the theoretical side to the practical side. Um, operating on the ground, when people ask me where Mara's regional offices are, I tell them I'm in 20, my regional offices are in 22 countries. I mean, you have to operate locally. Why do you say, ah, there you go. You have to operate locally. You have to be practical, Victor. You know, this whole theoretical thing of sitting in one country trying to manage 15 doesn't work. That's very theoretical. We'd be failing in our duty if we didn't talk about Ebola on this occasion, however. It is worrying that health workers aren't feeling that motivated. I must tell you, Wale, enough to continue fighting the scourge in Liberia of all places. That's tragic. Well, it does seem like most health workers actually do care, Victor, as the strike didn't go ahead as planned, according to reports from Liberia. Many Liberian health workers on the front line of the battle against Ebola ignored calls on Monday to strike over poor pay and working conditions, and most hospitals and clinics were operating normally, officials and charity workers said. Alfonso were head of the medical staff at Liberia's island clinic in the capital Monrovia said workers had decided to come in after appeals from the general public and according to the World Health Organization more than 95 health workers in Liberia have died and that's about the same number as in Sierra Leone. It would be difficult to go on strike under those circumstances but put yourself in the position of those health workers. Wale, are you excited by the commitments coming out of a World Bank group meeting in Washington last week? 
Well, it's part of an initiative called the New Global Infrastructure Facility, G or GIF, which has the potential to unlock billions of dollars for infrastructure in the developing world. The GIF launch, which took place at the 2014 IMF World Bank Annual Meetings in Washington last week, drew the heads of some of the world's largest asset management and private equity firms, pension and insurance funds, and commercial banks, who joined multilateral development institutions and donors to work as partners in Africa and, of course, over the rest of the developing world. The World Bank Group President Jim Young Kim said the, pre the presence of a broad range of institutional investors at the GIF signing ceremony sent a powerful message with the most recent data showing that private infrastructure investments in emerging markets and developing economies dropped from $186 billion in 2012 to $150 billion last year. And that really tells us that a lot more can be going into this, segment, into this sector. We never finish Africa Business News without putting our team on the spot. Wale and Bonnie, I'm going to ask you, if I had 10,000 US dollars to invest in any stock, in your region, which one would you pick and why? Bonnie, let's start with you. Well, Victor, 10,000 is very flattering. Uh, but uh, if I had that kind of money, I'll pick in one of two stocks. Either BAT, whose share price we saw hitting their 1,000 mark, the first in the region, or good old TransCentury has been making a lot of uh, infrastructure investments, so that's a good place to put your money. Excellent. BAT or banking. What about you, Wale, out of Lagos? Well, you, you said $10,000, and I think I'll put it in a bank right now, Victor. FCMB, I think the story is really interesting. What we're seeing with that uh, lender is that it used to be a, a, a carving a niche in investment banking, but it has since, especially after making some acquisitions, now um, shown a strong focus on retail banking, and I think that is likely to work out very well. That is the strategic area that most banks are looking at in Nigeria, and if we look at the uh, recent success with some micro lending uh, products I think that FCMB may be one of the winners in that space well yet again we have two financial services players but we are never really done here on Africa business news until we have done our trivia of the week this time I ask you Wally and Bonnie and everyone out there which country celebrates the adoption of its national flag on October 14th the adoption of the national flag not independence Wow. That um, be Madagascar. <laughs> Madagascar, not the one we see in the movies, by the way. It was popularized by the animated movies. But <laughs> Madagascar Republic, the land of exotic biodiversity, is the world's premier producer of vanilla, formerly known as Malagasy Republic in the Indian Ocean Island country, adopted the white, red, and green flag on October 14th in 1958, two years before independence from France. The colors red and white are said to have been the symbol close to the hearts of the Marina Kingdom, which was subdued by the Fr French in 1896. And October 14th is also observed in Tanzania as Mualimu Julius Nyerere Day to commemorate the death in 1999 of the first president of the Republic of Tanzania. And to those in Kenya, happy heroes day for the 20th of October. I'm sure Beatrice will tell us about it next week. That's all we have time for this week. Bonnie Tunya in Nairobi, thank you very much. And Wale Famuro out of Lagos, Nigeria. Well, stay tuned to CNBC Africa. We are back with you next week with more Africa business news. Until next week, I come in and wait. Cheers. <laughs>